thank you everyone for taking the time to come out here today. We actually had to book uh, a bigger room because of the tremendous interest that we received in this event. But perhaps that shouldn't have surprised us too much. After all, democracy and the citizens' place in politics have been in the news a lot the last little while. Since the economic crash of 2008, it's become harder and harder to hide the fact that the rhetoric and the outcomes of democracy are not adding up. And it's often said that this has led to higher levels of cynicism and voter apathy. But the truth is that voter turnout has been pretty stable over the last few decades, both in Ireland and abroad. Even when compared to turnout over the last century, we see fluctuations, as we've seen in the past, but we're not seeing a complete nosedive. Party membership, protests, and participation in petitions are all relatively stable, in some cases even on the increase. What's more, people are communicating with each other on a much larger scale than they did in the past. Between 2006 and 2016, 70 million comments were left on the Guardian website. And people send 200 billion tweets a year and search 1.2 trillion times on Google alone. And 72% of Irish people, so nearly three quarters of Irish people, said that they frequently rate, comment, and share online news stories. And the common misconception is that all of this new communication has created some kind of a problem and is the cause of political dissatisfaction. But really, it's just highlighted the pre-existing problem, that most people don't have the means to effectively participate in politics. And it's actually done so in a fairly positive and egalitarian way. After all, there was political upheaval before the internet, believe it or not. There was fake news before the internet. All that the internet has done is that it's given the average person a little box to complain in, but not the means to effectively alter the political landscape. People want to participate. The vast majority of people are fully aware that politics sets the parameters of their entire lives, from the roads they drive on to the food they eat, but they don't have the means to participate. And that is the perfect, most foolproof recipe for frustration. We all know that people react badly under stress, be that in public or in their personal lives. No amount of preaching will ever change that basic formula. We can say it's terrible that people vote for Donald Trump, a Marine Le Pen, or Nigel Farage, and we can sit around and wring our hands about that, or we can do something about it that acknowledges the root of the problem. People don't want the appearance of engagement. They want engagement. But in our democracies, we've sidelined the people by focusing excessively on the election as the sole means of effective participation, and then ensuring that it's not really all that effective. The average person only votes in a national election 12 times over the course of their entire lives. So, assuming you spend a minute in the polling booth, that's 12 minutes. That's not even time for a decent cup of tea. And after that fleeting voting experience, we tend to end up with representatives that disproportionately come from certain wealth backgrounds, a background that increasingly you can't even achieve yourself into. For example, in Ireland, 7% of students attend fee-paying secondary schools, but 17% of sitting TDs in the last doll did, and 50% of ministers in the last government did. And if the political system stays the way it is and does not react to our changing world, Technology will almost certainly exacerbate these inequalities by increasing the control that a very few people can exercise over others. Surveillance, gene technology, automation, unmanned warfare are only some of the things we face in a world where 1% of the population already owns over 50% of the wealth. This is all coming at us like a self-driving lorry without any brakes. And we're facing this at a time when citizens are not only increasingly marginalized nationally, but with virtually no power 
internationally. Trade treaties, such as those that underlie the World Trade Organization and IMF agreements, set the parameters for pretty much all other political decisions. By creating the legal and economic framework that set outside the political realm and not subject to further negotiation or alteration. The effects of these agreements are pretty direct, down to the lowest levels of politics. But the reverse ladder of control is not. Ireland is a much better country than most. We have referenda, we have the single transferable vote, which is more proportionate than first past the post. And we probably have some of the most informed citizens in the Western world. We're very connected. You can tell someone something in Dublin and get a text about it from someone in Cork 10 minutes later. True story. But we can do a lot better. And in order to meet future challenges, we're going to need to do a lot better. And we're going to talk about some of those things today. One of the things I've piloted is direct digital decision making. So instead of guessing what people want or telling them what they should want, I just ask them. In an online environment, where people can contribute in a horizontal, collaborative level. Then I try to work down the options that the majority have endorsed. <coughs> Similar processes have been used by the government of Taiwan and the Pirate Party of Iceland, and increasingly in businesses and cooperatives. Something closely related to this is participatory budgeting, which allows people to decide how part or all of a budget is allocated. This form of participation originally developed offline in Brazil and has since been used online and offline in Paris, Berlin, Chengdu, China, Boston, and New York, to name but a few. Today, Jez Hall of PP Partners in the UK and Gus O'Connell of South Dublin County Council are going to share their expertise in running participatory budgeting projects. Citizens' assemblies take a somewhat different tack relying on sortition or lottery selection of small groups of people to debate and decide on a given set of issues. Such assemblies often prepare the ground for referenda on divisive topics. For example, on changing the voting system in parts of Canada, or our own assembly on the Eighth Amendment here in Ireland. Assemblies can also be used in an advisory capacity. Australia has made heavy use of such assemblies, which they term citizen juries, over the past 10 years. For example, in advising on the City of Melbourne's 10-year financial plan and on public transportation improvements in the state of Victoria. This is accompanied by a growing argument to replace the upper chambers of parliament, such as the Senate, with lottery-selected members of the public. Tom Arnold, who chaired the Constitutional Convention in 2012, is going to share his experience on this topic with us today. Finally, one of the greatest barriers to participation is information. Not for nothing are we said to be living in the information age. But paradoxically, it can seem more difficult than ever to effectively share and receive the important information that citizens need to make decisions. Keith Moore, CEO of SmartVote.ie, and Dennis Parfenov of the Open Knowledge Foundation are going to share how their organizations are using technology to inform people in a deeper and more accessible way than ever before. But we won't just hear from them. Keeping with the spirit of more inclusive democracy, we've left space in the agenda to enable everyone from the audience to participate. So I'd like to welcome county councillors, NGO staff, and members of the public here today. Please share your thoughts often, freely, and above all, enjoy your day with us.